Hello and welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. You know, in this age of technology, there are many of us that feel that we have way too much to do, that we are way too busy. And a lot of us are a lot, uh, do all kinds of stuff and we are very busy. I was in a restaurant the other day and I heard one lady talking to another and she said, I am just way too busy. Think of all the magazines I have to look through. So evidently she has tons of magazine subscriptions and she has to look through all of those magazines, and that's what her idea of busyness is. Well, I think about some of the busyness that I've had to deal with through the years. Before I lived in this area, I was in an area where there was a major university, and I was living with my mother. And I had a full-time job at that university. And then about three times a week, I would get up at about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, drive up here to where I am now, uh, and that's about a three-hour drive, participate in, in the conferences, do some counseling, do chapel services, and uh, have a quick lunch, and then go ahead and go back to where the university was, which is about a two and a half hour drive, get there by 3.30, and work until 11 o'clock, and then to go home, because I was living with my mother, so I went to be with her afterwards, and that happened about three times a week. So busyness is a part of most of our lives, but I'm not the only one that's too busy. Everybody is very too busy. Busy, I think, and we don't have enough rest time, and we don't have enough time to ourselves. Well, by, by the, I came across some interesting facts here. By the time your life is over, you will have spent six months at stoplights, eight months opening junk mail, and a year and a half looking for lost things, and five years standing in line. And the problem with this is that we assume if we're busy that we're being productive, that we're doing good things, and we lose sight of the fact that sometimes God calls us to rest. And sometimes our busyness is just fraught with uh, nonsensical kinds of stuff. We assume, though, that God is pleased with our busyness and therefore we are serving him. As Christians, we are called to be Christ-like. After all, we are created by God who is a potter, and we are the clay. And I'm going to read a verse. This is not going to be on the screen, but this is what it says, Isaiah 64, 8. O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all all the work of your hands. Now, it's a nice verse, and I like it. But here's an interesting fact about potters and clay. When a potter begins working with clay, he never presses down on the clay. He always raises the lump of clay up, and his hands are continually in touch with the clay as he spins it around, and he fashions it into a masterpiece. His hands are on his creation, and his creation is like him. Now that reminds me of Christianity. We are never pressed down by God. We are always lifted up. Well, well, sometimes we don't feel like that. That is the truth. And then he works with us and his hands are on us and we are his creation and he fashions us into what we need to be. Now it's said that if you listen to a pipe organ, you can determine who made it. For every organ maker has a distinctive way that they make their organs. No matter how you uh, do the organ, the pipe organ, I'm not talking about the electronic things, we're talking about the real pipe organ. And every person who makes pipe organs has their own bent on it, their own spin on it, and it's a little different than any other organ. All pipe organs play in an individual way, and they sound a little different from each other. Each organ bears is the characteristic of its builder. But why shouldn't God create us differently so that our interests and our ways of expressing ourselves are slightly different? And yet we blend with each other, and, eat, and with God's gifts, we work with each other, and so we can create beautiful things together. But it takes listening to God and allowing his hand to direct us. We can't do it on our own. 
God has created you with gifts that you can use for him. Your gifts are different than other people's gifts. You're not a carbon copy of anybody else. You are you as an individual. And God has never taken his eyes off from you. He has brought you through all of your experiences so you can do what he wants you to do. And when Jesus was on earth, he did what his father wanted him to do, what God wanted him to do. And the first verse on the screen is John 10 30 and it says this I and my father are one I'm going to read it again I and my father are one and we are and I'm not putting this on the screen right now but we are the temple of the Holy Spirit God resides within us and another verse I want to read and this is not going to be on the screen and that's Ephesians 3 20 and it says this God can do everything you know, far more than you could even imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Now, John 15, here again, I'm, I'm going to read uh, a couple of verses. These will not be on the screen. John 15, 16 says, we have been chosen, or ye have been chosen. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever ye ask in the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And Ephesians 2.10, which is also not on the screen, says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, a modern translation of that verse says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The things that we do that are good, that God has called us to do, we've been called to do those things, and he's created those things for us to do, and he's created us to do those things. It's almost like a link. It actually works together, and that is a part of our work. God guides us in our work. He gives us our work to do, and we do that work, and he prepares that work for us to do. So this is the point that I'm trying to make. God knew from before the earth's creation what he wanted each one of us to do, and our work was planned in advance. He has equipped us with the abilities that we need to do the work that he has foreordained for us to do. He's given us the education. He's given us the experiences, and he will do it, the work that he wants to do in us because we're not doing it alone. He is with us all the time. We have been gifted for it. All we have to do is learn whatever we need to do and do it the best that we can. And he takes over from there and he anoints us to do our work and he will bring it to completion. It will be done on time. He will perfect it and he will lead us and guide us through it. We can't fail because he can't fail. We have the privilege of working with him. We get rewarded and it gets glory and he gets the glory. Now I want to read you part of a quote. A story is told about Theodore Roosevelt who boarded a ship in an African port because he was returning from a hunting safari. And great crowds gathered to celebrate his visit. The red carpet was rolled out for him. He was given the best suite on board the ship. He was the center of attention during the sail home. At the same time, there was another man on board that ship. He was an old missionary who had given his life for God in Africa. And no one paid any attention to him. No one noticed him at all. But there was no, and there was no one there to greet him when he returned to land. So he went to a small hotel and he knelt beside his bed and he prayed, I'm not complaining, Lord, but I just don't understand. I gave my life for you in Africa, and it seems that no one cares. I just don't understand. And it seemed then, just at that moment, that God laid his hand on the old man's shoulder and said, Missionary, you're not home yet. And God does give us rewards. The second verse on the screen is going to be 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and this is what it says. No eye has seen 
No ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Let me read that again. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And so what is going to happen is that when he gives the rewards, they're going to be very, very much larger than you could even imagine. And the third verse on the screen is going to be Romans 18, 16, and 17. And this is what it says. I'm going to read part of of it, and then I'm going to go and read the rest of it. Romans 8.16 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now let me read the whole thing. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Your work is important, even if you don't realize it, even if you don't even understand it. We tend to go around thinking our lives are pretty humdrum. We do the same things day by day, and we think of that our, our life is humdrum. But we don't get the big picture, and we cannot see how God is using us. God can accomplish great things through us, but you can't be careless about your faith. You have to be serious about your faith, because he is the potter, and he has created you to be just what he wants you to be. You, reach, you, have, you need whatever you need, he will supply, but he will create you to be exactly what he wants. And you really need to seek God out and, and rely upon him to show you what it is that he really wants you to do. He's going to give you the gifts that you need. He will anoint you, and he will provide the education, training, and experiences that you need. And God has chosen you. You need to remember that. You were not an accident. You were in God's heart and mind before even the foundation of the world. A lot of people in this day don't realize that God has known you and he knew where you were going to be and he created you, but he knew you long before you were created. He knew about you from the beginning of time. We don't understand the beginning of time because God is eternal, but he knew you from before the time that you were born. He was your savior from before the time that you were born. Looking back at the potter and the clay explanation that I've used before, it is true that God never pressures you down. And he is the potter and he has continually lifted you up. As he worked with you, you are a perfect fit and a perfect tool for a precise role that he has in mind for you, a plan for your life that he has for you. And I'm going to close with a verse from Ephesians 1.4. It's a modern English translation of that verse. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Now, he has loved you all along. He will continue to love you. You don't have to ask him to love you because he is love. You ask God to love you, you're asking water to be wet because it's his characteristic. Love is God's characteristic. You don't have to ask him to be what he already is. He is love and he will love you. And so as you go through your life and follow him, he'll make you the person that he wants you to be. He will be with you as you do your work for him. He will give you the rewards for that. He will get the glory for that. And you will find that busyness doesn't mean anything. As long as you're doing what his will is, you don't have to worry about being too busy or not busy enough. God will take care of all of it. All you have to do is follow him. So I'm going to close it here. We'll be doing something else next time. Please join me then.